Welcome to Heart Speak Podcast, episode 205, The View from the Center. Well, hello there, wherever you are in the world, you are welcome. It's good to be back with you. And I hope you're managing to stay relatively centered with Uranus going now backwards and Mars in Gemini bringing a lot of uncertainty to our minds, to our thinking. And it may well affect your sleep state or your dream state. And what happens is that we may have new and exciting dreams, or we may find ourselves being anxious because it's stirring up old fears. And even though something may not be happening in the external world, we're reacting to it as if it is happening. So I just keep my advice, stay rooted, stay practical, get your hands involved in something like gardening or cooking, walk, be on the ground, keep your feet on the earth, and you'll get through this. And this is really important with the subject I'm bringing from today. It's a very big subject, so I hope you're ready. I started by reading about what happened to us about 12,000 years ago, because I'm going to a wonderful part of Southeast Turkey to see some of the sacred sites, such as Gobliateki and Karantepi and others. And I'm really excited about that because these sacred sites that have wonderful engravings on the stones were probably built around 9,500 BC and were surprisingly covered by the people around 8,000 BC. So of course the questions have to be, why did they build them and why did they cover up the site only to be found relatively recently in the last few decades? And the question is, what were the messages that they were leaving and why did they feel that they needed to build these amazing sites? And what we understand from some of the teachings and the work of people like Graham Hancock and Freddie Silver, others have done this amazing work of looking and saying, wow, there was something called the Younger Dryas effect that happened around 12,900 years ago, which was about 10,900 BC, and continued to about this period of time, 9,500 BC. So what was the Younger Dryas world? It was seen as a time where the earth became cooler for some reason. There was a climate change. Hey, does that sound familiar? And the earth became cooler and cooler. And then there was a flood, a deluge. And it is said that this related to the flooding of Atlantis, the whole city or civilization going under the waters. But it didn't only affect the Americas or those around the Atlantic Ocean. It seemed to have affected a vast area, especially this area that I'm talking about, which, which was called Mesopotamia. It wasn't called that in those times, but that area of what we call the Middle East. So the younger Dryas, came around, let's say, 12,000 years ago. And it was thought, and certainly by the different people I've read, that it was caused by increasing comets hitting this Earth as meteors, so increasing meteor strikes. And it occurred over a period of time, so it wasn't just one meteor and that was it. There were increasing meteor strikes caused changes to the environment changes to the, um, the sun. And there were many stories around the world, mythologies that have been collected to show that the people describe a time where the sun wasn't in the sky or it disappeared for a while or it became very cold or it became very dry. So clearly there was climate change back then and definitely resulted eventually in the, the sudden melting of these icebergs or the ice that had collected, and hence uh, the loss of a lot of land and the changing of how the land looked at that time. But when I went further back, and I did, I saw that every 12,000 years, something like this has happened. So there's evidence geologically of the land changing or the trees dying or the animals dying. 12,000 years, 24,000 years, 36,000 years, 48,000 years. You get my, my meaning. And then there have been mini 
time. So 6,000 years ago, then 18,000 years. So there's there's been these changes, you could say every 6,000 years, but the major ones have been every 12,000 years. And they had often been thought to be related to the sort of changes we're going through now, the weakening of the magnetic field of the earth, disturbances of the sun, the sun doing different things than it would do before. We're certainly seeing that because we're seeing changes on Pluto and Neptune that would not be necessarily accepted or understood. There's a, there's a change in the atmosphere of Pluto or changes in the way in which Neptune is uh, existing at this time. And people are watching to see what planet will be affected next. Obviously, we're, we're down the line of that. And then we're in this galactic sheet now, some people call it a photon sheet or a, all this information coming from the galaxy, which I'm very much aware of. And I've been talking about this time where we see the sun being much more uh, connected to the center of the galaxy for this 36 week year period of which 2012 was in the center. If 2012 is in the center, 2030 is the end of this. But we're certainly in this time where we are literally in line for anything that comes from the center of the galaxy. It's like a wave that's coming out. And when we understand that the center of the galaxy is a black hole, white hole, we're really seeing that maybe as we described back in 2012, the galaxy burped and we're in the stream of energy that's coming out of the center of the galaxy. Now, we can see this in a very positive way that the fact is that we are now being bombarded or showered or gifted with all this cosmic energy that comes from the center of the galaxy. Or we can see it as a challenge because it is affecting everything that exists within the galaxy, which is these billions of stars, including our own star, which is known as the sun. So our sun is being affected. We're seeing flares, we're seeing changes to how the sun, uh, even the gases of the sun is changing. And obviously with our weakened earth field, there is this potential of a, of a reversal or at least a temporary reversal of the magnetic fields. Now, before you go off and panic and say, okay, I better start prepping for this. There's not an awful lot that can be done at this time. And what we do know is this is a 12,000 year cycle. So, the predictions are that this isn't going to happen tomorrow. So please stay with me. Don't, don't turn me off at this moment. But it made me look at these cycles. It made me look at, are we cyclical beings? Now, I believe that we have an existence, our universe we see as being cyclical. We have cycles of the moon. We have cycles of our breath. We, we know that there are two facets of everything within our body. We might call them polar opposites, the breath in, the breath out, heart contracting, heart relaxing. So we know that we are set up to be in a cyclical nature in this physical form. And therefore we know that the sun, the moon, the galaxy, they also exist in this cyclical form. That We know that we live in actually a spiral galaxy. But it made me think, is this... Does this understanding of the cycles lock us into a belief, which David Icke has been talking about, of a simulated trap where we believe we just keep going around in cycles? Sometimes we get into a spiral, but we're still going round and round in circles. Okay, you can see where my, my mind is going. <clears throat> and that then led me into hierarchies. And the reason I thought of that was because Yes, we may feel that we're no longer on a linear path, but we may find ourselves going round and round in circles on a cyclical path and not getting anywhere. So I looked up the meaning of what it is to be in a hierarchy, and the word hierarchy means heros, which means supernatural, and archi, which is ruler. And this tied into my research that I'm doing before going to Gubletechi, which is who were the people who came to teach the hunter-gatherers 
how to build these sites. And once again, the wonderful research of Freddie Silver and Graham Hancock, they, they talk about after the catastrophe, after the deluge, the survivors came from the seas, often seven in a boat and a leader number eight. And these were seen as the people, they were called the people of the serpent or the people of the jaguar, the teachers. And they went around the world and brought the wisdom that had been lost in the flood. But I also sense that they were those who were often seen as gods because, wow, where did they come from? I thought everything had disappeared. So they were probably semi-human, semi-gods, but they were often put in a position of hierarchy, a sense that they knew something, they had magic tools, they had magic gifts that the normal people didn't have. And I had to think things haven't changed that much. So this whole idea of hierarchy, which I had assumed had only really come in over the last maybe two or 3,000 years, as I read back, it was there a long, long time ago. Now, not in every civilization, I want to say, I don't think it was always a hierarchical system, but you could say the hierarchy have sustained themselves where other systems have fallen away. If you look, for instance, at the Minoan culture in Crete, there you see that there were leaders and priests and, and everybody was in this culture, but there were no images of the leaders. There wasn't like, here's the king, here's the one who's top of the pile. It was everybody just had a job to do. And they did whatever job they did really well, that was their job to do. And they were not prized any more than the person who wasn't perhaps the leader. And the other side I look at is also what I've seen in Turkey in, in wonderful civilizations there that are about 8,000 years old, where, yes, there was the men and the women, and the women were acknowledged as the spiritual leaders, but it didn't make them more important than the men who were the physical leaders. So everybody knew the job they were here to do. Everybody was respected. And I'm always hearing people talking about, ah, oh, it was a matriarchal society, then it became patriarchal, and now we're going to make her. No, no, no. It was egalitarian. Everybody was respected. And that's what we need to be moving towards. It's not polarized. It's about everybody is a part of the whole. How do we honor everybody's piece of jigsaw so that we can become unified? And I felt that there were so many systems that are really still living in a very patriarchal, excuse me, hierarchical manner. And we're blaming it on the patriarchal, but really it, it doesn't matter who it is. It's just that it's more like a pyramid or as I say, a circle where you can never get to the center because you're constantly going around the outside. And that's why I wanted to call it view from the center. Because that, you know, once we get on that hamster wheel, it's no different from being on a managerial ladder or a spiritual path. We're, we're still climbing, we're still moving, we're still having to constantly work to get anywhere. So how do we get back to the center? <laughs> How do we get rid of these systems that cause us to believe that only when we get to the top or only when we have done enough circles are we good enough? And that was the principle of David Icke's new book, The Trap, which is this idea that we need to keep reincarnating to be a better person. And I often hear in the teachings that, oh, yes, you... You know, Osiris's death was so that he could be born again. And I'm, I agree with the idea that every month the moon is born again and we have a new moon. But maybe even in the fact that I like the idea of cycles rather than a, a linear path, maybe we need to stop going around in circles. 
maybe we even need to stop spiraling towards something. Maybe there's nothing to go towards. Maybe we need to stay in the center or at least take a chance to come back into the center and see it for what it is. You know, if you think of what a, a teepee looks like, it's a pole in the center with the material around the outside. And that pole in the center, when if you look from it from above, you see just a dot, don't you? A dot with a circle around it. And I think so many times what the ancient people were really trying to teach isn't give, my, give, give me your power and I'll show you how to do this or give me your money or give me your, your following, give me your, your gratitude. It was more like, let me teach you how to come into the center. Let me teach you to be able to see everything from where we see it. Because you cannot see everything from the outside, from going around and around in the circle or being lower down in the pile of the, the pyramid. And this game that's played about, I see everything, but you can't, is part of the secret game. You can't climb the mountain. You can't see the world as I'm seeing it. You have to do all these things before you can. And in so many of the teachings that I'm reading about, the Anunnaki teachings, Moses, anybody, they all climb this mountain and then they speak to God. <clears throat> and Olympus had the same idea. The gods of the Greek gods lived on Olympus, a mountain. So there's so many analogies about having to climb a mountain and only if you're able to do that can you be the holy one that everybody's going to look up to and then you bring the wisdom down and you tell the people what to do, but you never let them climb the mountain. You never teach them to climb the mountain. You just teach them what to do. I feel this is our problem. Whether hierarchies are made of power, money, elitism, they always cause fear, lack of confidence, shame, they always cause anger and frustration. And everybody is trying to make themselves feel that they can at one day be in that center of that pole. They can be at the top of the mountain. And the answer is you're already there. And I sense that these hierarchies are collapsing. These spirals are collapsing. Does that mean that I think that we won't perhaps go through some disaster? I don't know. But I wonder how much we are keeping the idea of a 12,000 year cycle going because in these rocks, in these stones that were carved or the teachings that were carried after the last deluge, we keep teaching about you've got to improve yourself. You've got to be a follower of, you know, whoever, Krishna, Christ, Muhammad. You're only going to get there if you follow these people. You're only going to get there if you're a better person. And I hear it the same in the spiritual world. Oh, you're in the third dimension. You want to get to the fifth dimension. Oh, you're in fourth density. You need to be in fifth density. My goodness. And I've all my life tried to get people to stop counting the chakras. Number one, number two. Don't tell me about this. The chakras are also not linear. But of course, I'm going to say, yes, they're circular. But they're only circular to the fact that you're expressing something from the center. So I believe reincarnation happens because we keep telling ourselves we're not good enough. We need to do more. We need to learn more. We need to grow more. We need to be a better person. And there are plenty of people <laughs> who we could call spiritual leaders, uh, hierarchical leaders, church leaders. There are plenty out there who keep saying, yes, you're not good enough. You can't come where I am. And ironically, 
I think that all they do is actually do master tricks in some, some ways. They're not there. They're only seeing part of the whole. And it's their fear, their shame, their insecurity that causes them to talk to us like that. What is it? That, that wizard that looks very big, but is actually very small. So what happens when we come to our center? When we come to the center, just imagine again, you're in the, the center. If you want to say a circle, a, a circle with a point in the center, when you step in that center, you see everything. And you can become everything. It isn't about staying in the center. And I believe our journey was about coming, being whole to start with, being divine to start with, being in unity to start with. And then making a choice to move out of the center to experience something and then come back to the center. And then moving off into another direction and coming back to the center. I think what happened is that once we left the center to experience something, and again, not to, to improve ourselves, just to experience something, as we often say, you know, it's just to be creative in the outer world. We then got banned or separated from that center. And we were told, you have to climb this ladder. You have to improve yourself. You have to walk a better path. And it's that that's kept us from knowing that we're already there. It's that that's kept us locked into beliefs created often by, as I say, many, many uh, religions and politicians and others who say, you're not going to reach this until I let you. And the secret, if there is a secret, is that you're already there. And that they never were. Because if you have to do that to other people, you've never, ever come into your wholeness. So the secret is you're there. And that from that center, when you keep coming back, you actually enrich your own center. Again, you could say, well, that's a purpose. But the more I come from my center and extend myself into the world and come back to my center, realizing there's nowhere else to go, I see much more, not because I'm limited, but because I allow myself to. I feel stronger, more able to see. And so do I think that we are in for a disaster? Possibly. But I think that when we don't see it as a punishment for humanity, that we've done something wrong, that we've damaged the earth, that we are the bad ones, when we stop playing that game created by these little tiny wizards that really are not wizards, and we say, hang on a minute, you have no power over my existence. I'm coming back to the center, move over, I'm, I'm back. I'm going to climb that mountain, get off it. <laughs> we then know who we are from the center. And I believe that the teachings weren't about climbing the ladder, doing all those things that I mentioned. So many of them, such as places like Gobaliteki, were the meaning of the word was the umbilicus, the navel, the pole. I think all of these places that are sacred, certainly many of the ones that I've studied, Cusco, Easter Island, were all known as navels, Delphi, center of the universe, that when we stand in those places, we are everything and nothing. And it's from that place that we are meant to be creating, not from a place of scarcity, lack, or shame. So what do I advise you to do? I advise you to come back to your center, not a center that exists in a linear path, one that just says, I am that I am. I am whole now. And I create from this wholeness 
not from a place of emptiness. And anybody who tells you you have to do this, this, this to reach a spiritual perfection or a managerial perfection, tell them to move over because they've lost the plot. I hope this helps to inspire you. Stay in your center, but don't be scared to exist in your wholeness because that is who we are. Until next week, bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Heart Speak Podcast with Dr. Christine Page. Please check out all Heart Speak episodes in the podcast archive section on www.christinepage.com. HeartSpeak is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and now playing on Amazon Music and iHeartRadio. You can also watch the Archive Podcast on Christine's channel on YouTube and now on Rumble. Connect with Christine on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, including her newest Facebook group, The Great Mother Calling. Do share with family, friends, colleagues. Join us next time for another edition of Heart Speak.